are uh, all the coordinators ready uh, the event handlers uh, Josna and uh, team are you guys ready Sam yes ma'am Uh, I guess uh, our principal is a bit uh, busy. He's uh, he's actually traveling right now. He said he will join whenever he can. So um, I guess we can start the program. Uh, Sharon, ma'am, if you don't mind, uh, let's start. Hello, am I audible? Yes, miss. Okay, so uh, Shema miss, uh, I got a message from our principal saying that he is uh, driving right now. Can we start the program? Uh, yeah, yes, Marina, we'll start. We'll start. Yeah. Sharon ma'am, uh, if you're ready, may we start? Ma'am, I believe your mic is on mute again. Sorry, <laughs> I no, keep forgetting. If the if the PPT can be shared, maybe I can begin. Yeah, no, ma'am. Uh, I mean, uh, we've got uh, some formalities before that, and we will move on to your talk in about fifteen minutes. Okay, thank you, ma'am. So uh, once again, it's really a pri uh, a happy moment and a proud moment for us at PG Department of English to have Dr. Sharon Dikuna with us. And also uh, I see a number of eminent um, research scholars as well as uh, professors from various institutes and universities across India. So I welcome you all and I hand over uh, the event to Josna Michael. Josna, you could please carry it from here. Thank you. Hello everyone. Life is like a book. Some chapters are sad, but some will be happy and some exciting. But if you never turn the page, you will never know what the next chapter holds. A very pleasant good morning to one and all present here. I'm Josna Michael will take the immense pleasure to welcome all in this beautiful occasion. The world is full of diamonds and gems. And we are having some of them here today. With this note, on behalf of our Naipunya family, I would like to give my heartiest welcome to our honorable chief guest, Dr. Sharon Dikuna, a leader, a principal, Reverend Father Baijo George Pondimpali, our assistant director, Father Sebastian Kalarikil, our HOD, Shema Ma'am, our program coordinators, all our faculty members, students, and everyone present here to this auspicious occasion. Welcome all. We know that we all are congregated here on this beautiful occasion as a part of e 2.0. So before we start this event, it is a good omen to start every occasion with the blessings of Almighty. Prayer does not change God, but it changes Him who prays. So I welcome Samuel Sebastian from S2BA for a prayer song. In his time, in his time, he makes all things beautiful 
in his time. Lord, please show me every day as you're teaching me your way that you do just what you say in your time. In your time, in your time, you make all things beautiful in your time. Lord, my life to you I bring. May each song I have to sing be to you a lovely thing. In your time, Lord, please show me every day as you're teaching me your way that you do just what you say in your time, in your time, in your time. You make all things beautiful in your time. Lord, my life to you I bring. May each song I have to sing be to you a lovely thing in your time. Be to you a lovely thing. In your time. Thank you so much, Samuel. So now I would like to welcome our assistant professor of English department, Philip Sir, for the welcome speech. Good morning, all. Uh, it's a moment of extreme pleasure to welcome you all to Naipunya School of Management. Uh, to attend this e-colloquium organized by the Department of English. Uh, we are in the third and final session of the series of e-colloquium 2.0. Uh, we had a very fruitful session in the last two months. And today's session is on the topic travel literature uh, and it is titled Mapping immobilities, the shifting intersections of space and time in the face of a pandemic normal. Travel literature is now a very popular and a familiar piano. In symbol, uh, it can be defined as uh, a traveler's note, observation, or his impressions of, on, of a journey or the description of the events, the people, the cultures, the tradition which he witnessed. And this literature seeks to communicate uh, the information about the newly discovered land and that it is, which is little known to the reader. So the literature's origin can be uh, traced from the early 15th and 16th centuries, an era uh, which we all know that it witnessed the great geographic discoveries. And we have America Vespucci's letters, Columbus Shiplog, Pigafetta's diary, a traveling companion of Magellan. And to the later part, uh, to which we may be more familiar uh, with, we have uh, Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, Swift's Gulliver's Travels, and our own Nirat C. Chowdhury's Passage to England, and many more. But as we are in a pandemic world, the immobility uh, that we face uh, is very significant in our daily life and literature as well. And I'm sure that this session on travel literature uh, will help you a lot to learn and expand your knowledge and interest in the same. I'm so happy uh, to do my duty uh, that is bestowed on me. I and uh, we, the department uh, is always indebted 
to our principal, Father Baiji George Pondempilli, uh, who is our guide, captain, and an inspiration. The positive spirit uh, who really encourages us uh, into innovative and effective endeavors. Uh, for the principal, I welcome you uh, to this session. I am profoundly delighted to take an opportunity to introduce the speaker uh, of today's session, Dr. Sharon Dikunha, uh, Assistant Professor, Department of English, St. Joseph's College for Women, uh, Alapura, Kerala. Uh, let me brief uh, uh, Dr. Sharon uh, through her achievements. Uh, that will be helpful for the people, uh, or the participants, to know more about her. She is uh, a model student and academician as well. Uh, the third rank holder in the University of Kerala uh, for the undergraduate BA English in 2007. First rank holder uh, in MA English Language and Literature uh, in Kerala University uh, in 2009. And she had qualified her junior research fellowship uh, in 2008, uh, while she is doing her MA. And uh, she done her PhD uh, at the Institute of Kerala at Trivandrum. And she was awarded a doctorate uh, from the University of Kerala uh, in 2020, October. And her thesis was based on colonialism and the making of Kerala, uh, literary imaginations of the Portuguese intervention. Uh, Dr. Sharon Dikunha uh, is, has a number of paper presentations and publications to her credit. Uh, being an academic, uh, she has proved her skill in various topics through guiding PG and UG students as well as their projects. Dr. Sharon, um, on behalf of the Naibunya family and the Department of English, I welcome you to this session. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. I welcome uh, Ms. Shema Prakash, our dear Chodi, the Department of English, uh, to this session. And um, I welcome all the participants, uh, teachers, research scholars uh, who have showed their interest um, in the ecologium. And uh, to my colleagues and uh, PG and UG students from different colleges across India. And we are so happy uh, to see that we had uh, registrations from West Bengal, um, Telangana, Maharashtra, and all. And, and we are thankful to you. And I wholeheartedly welcome you all to this session. Let me conclude uh, opening a book is like opening a door. I wish this session on travel literature help you to widen your perspectives and conquer new world, new landscape, new cultures, uh, which is still unknown to us. Thank you all. Have a beautiful time ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much, Philip, sir. Darker the darkness. Brighter the lights, like a candle filling a room with light. A teacher sheds knowledge on a student's void mind. On behalf of the Naipunya family and everyone present here, I'm profusely overjoyed to welcome our Honorable Chief Guest, Dr. Sharon Dikuna, Assistant Professor, Department of English, St. Joseph College for Women, Alapura. So ma'am, I request you to start the session on the topic Mapping Mobilities and Immobilities, the shifting in the session of space and time in the face of a pandemic normal. So ma'am, now the platform is yours. Thank you, Josna. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful heartwarming welcome. And uh, uh, I would like to clarify in the beginning that e even though initially uh, it was Anuja, um, faculty member of Naipunya who had talked to me in initially, uh, and then uh, I had told her that I would be dealing with travel literature because my intention was to, to think about the way travel would be affected 
especially in the times of the pandemic. And this thought had come to me on account of the fact that I had actually done a paper last year uh, based on the theory of mobilities propounded by John Ari. And uh, it was on the basis of this that I had worked on a number of travel blogs that had appeared at that point in time. And I was curious to know how the writing of travel blogs and travel literature in general would have been affected after the onset of the pandemic. However, uh, I couldn't uh, come across any relevant materials on the same. How, but uh, I also understood that the idea of mobilities or immobilities, in fact, was even more interesting to deal with. Because more than literature, it felt that it was the very notion of movement that came under attack after 2020, at least. So uh, that's the reason why I turned from literature to the idea of mobilities in itself and the way it was possibly affected, uh, whether mobilities or immobilities came to be affected post the COVID situation or the onset of COVID. So uh, it, it is not travel literature that I'm dealing with here. It is more about the theory of mobilities and uh, the way the idea of mobilities in itself has uh, changed or shifted how these perspectives have come to be altered after the onset of the pandemic. So uh, perhaps uh, another time we would be able to think more about travel literature in general, but then what I have understood is travel literature, uh, or mainly on account of the pandemic, also has declined over the last year. So uh, I thought it would be much better to understand more about the way we move, because I'm sure all of you would agree that perhaps last year, none of us would have imagined that all those little things we had taken for granted, a walk to the park or along the beach, or uh, a small uh, moment of sharing six, sharing secrets in the alleys or in the, going to the streets. Uh, I, uh, on my personal behalf, I would, uh, I still cherish the memories that I had when I was in Bangalore along with my brother and uh, the walks, the long walks we had along the streets. So it is, I think, all those little moments that we miss right now. Perhaps we can do it in small measure. But it's definitely not the same. The condition, the whatever we had perceived of as normal has completely changed. And these small aspects of life are what I would like to talk about uh, in this session. And I hope that would be of some interest to you as well. And in connection with that, I have tried to chart out the theory of mobilities which was brought forth in the 1990s by a number of British researchers. And uh, I thought it was an interesting area of study and I wanted to share that field with you. So I hope it will be beneficial to you. So moving on to the session. Mapping mobilities or immobilities, the shifting intersections of time and space in the face of a pandemic normal. So before I move on to the topic, I would also like to tell you that uh, I don't intend to go into, because space and time in itself are uh, worthy of theoretical study. And I don't intend to go into those details because it would, uh, it would be too comprehensive and we will not be able to complete it in the space of this uh, period that I, I mean, this one hour. So I would like to focus more on the idea of mobility in general, especially because I was told that we have UG and PG students as well. So keeping that in mind, I thought it would be better to talk more about the notion of mobility, especially under the conditions of a new normal that we are facing. So this lecture is an attempt to understand the notion of mobilities, its relevance in the present scenario, and the way the idea of mobilities in general has come under attack on account of the pandemic situation. 
So the four major aspects that will be covered are the following. In the beginning, the first part, I would like to talk to you about the mobility's turn or the new mobility's paradigm in the humanities and the social sciences. The complex mobilities or the immobilities that came into being at many scales with the conditions brought into force by the pandemic. And eventually, I would like to talk about the redefining of personal, public and national borders as space times came to be reconfigured in accordance with the pandemic ridden world. So uh, this is in short, uh, the structure of my presentation. Can we have the next slide? The next slide, please. Yes, so these are the major aspects that I will be covering. The mobility's turn, the uh, re-evaluation re of the new mobilities, COVID-19 and its impact on mobilities, mobilities, surveillance and borders. So the next slide can we have. So initially, I would like to talk to you about what the mobility turn is. So you might be wondering, at least uh, the UG and PG, UG students at least would not be familiar with the idea of a turn. The word turn indicates an epistemological breakthrough. An epistemological breakthrough indicates uh, epistemology is a f any field of knowledge any field of knowledge in a particular discipline. So this idea of a turn indicates a breakthrough in uh, any disciplinary field of knowledge. And in the process, it has transformed the entire discipline. So the idea of mobility became relevant in the field of cultural studies, critical studies, and geography in general. So uh, the word turn means an epistemological breakthrough and the mobility turn or the breakthrough in the field of mobility studies occurred around the 1990s. And this idea has attracted attention in the field of sociology, especially because it was brought forth or popularized by John Ari, uh, who was a prominent philosopher, who, uh, a, a sociologist who first introduced uh, popularize the idea of mobilities in cultural studies and critical geography as well this idea came to be very uh, significant and uh, what these researchers intend to do is they point out that mobility is an important facet of social and quotidian life so you might be wondering why mobility it is on account of the fact that these researchers believed that till then, the idea of movement, till the 1990s at least, the idea of movement was understated or it was not brought to the forefront. You will understand why when we move on to the, come with the, to the next slides. So two prominent theorists in this field, Mimi Scheller and John Ari, they point out that the aspect of mobility had been overlooked by a sedentarist social theory. So sedentarist social theories, theorists vouchsafe for rootedness, belonging, and uh, being fixed in a particular place, uh, a static condition, and uh, notions of home, solidity, belonging, all these aspects are brought to the forefront by sedentarist social theorists. So this idea of mobilities came as a critique of sedent a sedentary social theory and it sought to foreground the idea of mobility, of movement as something that was of relevance. And I feel it is now post 2020 that perhaps the idea of mobilities has come to be revalued. Because initially, as I had told you, perhaps last year we would not have thought that movement would have been such an important thing in our lives. It is now that we realize that it is so, uh, when we look back at last year, we, we realize that, see, moving around and having fun with friends and all those little, little um, facilities that we had last year, 
it has come under scrutiny now. So the relevance of mobility or the value of mobility has been foregrounded even more than ever before. So mobility theory is based on the idea that social formations are always in a state of constant movement. And Jean Ari himself tries to bring in the idea that there is no such concept as society. So when he says this, what he intends is that it is difficult to think about society. Earlier, we had thought about society as something that is static, something uh, that is solid, a solidified structure. However, Ari tries to uh, bring in the idea that in an age where social media and digitalization has come to the forefront, it is impossible to think of a, a static society, a society that is grounded. So I, I hope I'm still audible because here the power has gone off. So can, can you hear me? Am I audible? Yes, yes ma'am. Ma you are yes, audible, ma'am. Ma okay, thank you. So can I have the next uh, slide, please? So what is the mobility term? As I had mentioned earlier, it, its origin goes back to the 1990s and it sought to analyze the very simple idea of movement. But when you, when you say movement, it is not as simple as you would guess because it not only really involves the movement of people, it involves the movement of ideas, movement of things, and even bodily movements, movements that take place internally. So we can never imagine the range of mobilities that uh, theorists have gone into. However, for, some, uh, for, uh, for the purpose of simplification, I would just like you to go with this definition. It analyzes the movement of people, ideas, and things. The systematic movement of people for work, settlement, family life, pleasure, politics or protest became worthy of study. So till then, this, this movement, especially a movement was considered as dead time. So just imagine uh, every day, even prior to the pandemic, all of us used to regularly go to work and uh, what mattered most or what we focused on most of all was what we did in the space of those hours. Perhaps if the work time was from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., what did you do during that period was what counted the most. However, your mobility theorists would try to point out that uh, the period prior to that, the time we commute from home to the workplace or back from the workplace to home is also important. And especially for women, women perhaps would be able to relate more to this. That is especially the time when you get a lot of me time. So I'm a person who used to commute from Alapi to, uh, sorry, from uh, Pullam to Alapi and back. And I would like to admit that it is during that period, that period, that one, one and a half hours that I travel, that I, a number of social interactions was forged. I was able to meet uh, with a number of other women who were also working and traveling. So that was a space when social interactions happened. And those who travel by train would also know uh, for, for a short period of time when I was on FDP doing PhD in Trantrum, uh, I used to commute by train. And it was during that time that uh, a number of interactions were forged, a number of small, uh, small talk and conversations happened. And if we look back at those moments now, we understand how important and cherished those moments were. Is the PPT still visible? Uh, I would, uh, because I, I cannot see the PPT now. Is it visible? Should I share? Can you hear me? All right. Teacher, uh, please wait for five minutes. She, she's connecting it, Marina. Okay. So should I pause for some time? Yeah, okay, if fine. you could. Ah, okay. I, I, I will just uh, uh, continue with uh, what I intend to, uh, I mean, to put, put across to you. So uh, it's very simple. Mobility theory places movement within the workings of social institutions and practice. When you say social institutions and practices, you know 
that in every society we have a set of norms uh, which are uh, generally accepted as part and parcel of life on account of the fact that these things are repeated over and over again. So even in our society, we have certain norms that we follow, we have certain practices that we follow, including the simple day-to-day -day things that we do, like walking, running, wheeling, biking, driving, all these simple things that we do and perhaps that we miss now. All those uh, ideas come under the rubric of mobility uh, theory. Going to work, taking care of children, preparing food, queuing, meeting, sending messages. So what happened to all these aspects of life now after the pandemic? It is still there, but definitely it has changed. And there has been a, a spillover that you cannot even imagine. There has, I would, I would say that for working women, as well as for men for that matter, uh, work from home has become a, an entirely new concept. Perhaps it was there earlier, but now it's very different because now there is no, uh, uh, the, the boundaries are blurred between work time and personal time. And again, for women, it, it is a gender issue as well because uh, in work time, we, we cannot place uh, bound the limits between the work time, the personal time or the domestic life that we lead. So uh, it, it has all become a, a sort of a, a merry chaos at present. And until that point of time, uh, when the mobility theorists started off with this discipline, this area, they claimed that mobility had been largely ignored, devalued, or taken for granted. So what they intended to do was, what the mobility theorists intended to do was, they wanted to place this up front as an issue, as something that had to be valued, not just taken for granted, the idea of movement. So the forerunner of the mobility theory is considered to be George Simmel. He was the key source of inspiration for mobility studies, and he sought to point out how connections are established and how social interactions take place among people. Two of his most important works were Bridge and Doe and The Metropolis and Mental Life. And in Bridge and Doe, he tries to bring in the metaphors of the bridge and the doe. And the bridge is a metaphor for social connections. And it, it according to him, it also tells that the bridge is an option as well, right? We can either opt to cross the bridge or we can opt just to stand at the end of the bridge and watch what is happening. So in every human being, there is this tendency to simultaneously connect as well as withdraw. And that is an option that we take. We, at the same time, we would like to interact and we would like to forge connections, but there are also moments when we feel that we should withdraw, we should be uh, backing out for a while. So the bridge is that option that you have. And if there is a door at the ed edge of the bridge, the door tells you whether you should open and forge an interaction or whether you should keep it closed. So that willingness to connect is what Simmel tried to point out through these metaphors of the bridge and the door. So the idea that human beings have this constant need to connect and to interact was first brought into the forefront by Simmel. And uh, at least that was foregrounded by Simmel. And then we have a number of other scholars who came like Tim Cresswell, James Clifford, Mark Audier, Manuel Castells and Karen Kaplan, who tried to expand about upon the study of mobilities. And what they in, tried to propound was that Mobility is an idea of systematic movement of people for various purposes. It can be for work, settlement, family life, pleasure, politics, or even protest. And this became worthy of study with a sudden surge of interest in this field. So the next slide um, can we have, it's about the major proponent of the mobility term, the sociologist, John Arie. 
who popularized the term mobilities through his work, Sociology Beyond Societies, Mobilities for the 21st Century, which came out in 2000. So in this work, it, it is in this work that Ari makes the controversial claim that there is no such thing as society. And uh, he quotes Margaret Thatcher, former British PM, who had also said the same thing and was chastised for the same. She said there is no such thing as society. So what Ari as well as Thatcher intended was not that uh, society has dissolved, dissolved all on a sudden, but that it is difficult to conceive of the concept of society at a time when, because it is different when you say society and being social, both are entirely different. And socializing happens not just under the framework of society. It also happens, especially in this digital age, it happens through a number of other mediums. Therefore, it was controversial to think of, or we, we could possibly um, th uh, think of a number of other options to socialize as well. Uh, Bowman's Liquid Modernity was another important work that came during that time, and it talked about how fluid movement could be in this digital age especially. And now we are experiencing it all the more at a time when everything is digital. Mobilities uh, on the one hand have come to a halt. We, uh, we do not move as we earlier used to from one place to the other. We, we do move, but we do it only when there is a, a need, a genuine need. But at the same time, there is a lot of movement happening where in digital space. And uh, on the one hand, when mobility has come to a halt or when it has slowed down, on the other hand, in digital space, there is a lot of movement happening. So Ari, into the back, long back in 2000, he had vouchsafed for the study of physical, imaginative, and virtual movements. And he felt that it was high time that the sociology of mobilities was taken into consideration. So when Ari talks about movement and mobility, he also takes care, Ari as well as Tim Creswell, they talk about the difference between movement and mobility. So it is similar to talking about location and place. When we say we are at a particular location, it refers only to that particular location. There is no history to that location. That it is devoid of any meaning or history. It is just that place. Nothing more counts. However, the idea of place is different. When you talk about place, it is a place that you have inhabited. You are also an equal part of that place. You, for example, if you go to a particular place and you take a photograph, then it is not just the place that comes at the background. It is you, your emotion, or what you have conveyed to the place. So if those who have gone to the Taj Mahal would know that you have probably clicked photos of yourself holding uh, the, the uh, tip of the uh, Taj Mahal, and uh, holding the Taj Mahal with the tip of your fingers. At least most of you have gone there would have clicked such a picture. So it also, can, along with the place, it also conveys a sense of emotion, your involvement there. And that is precisely the difference between the idea of location and the idea of place. Location is just the plain location. However, the, I, the, the term place carries along with it your, whatever you have contributed to it, your involvement and your contribution to it as well. Same is the difference between movement and mobility. Movement is just a movement from A, from place A to place B. But along with that movement, what have you done? Have you moved, suppose you are in a car and you're enjoying a drive and the wind is playing against your hair and your hair uh, keeps flying against the wind and uh, you, that, that is a moment of ecstasy. So it is that particular moment of ecstasy that makes your presence in the car an emotion and it is that that makes it mo mobility, what Ari calls mobility. Otherwise, it is just plain movement from A to B. Mobility brings along with it your social presence as well. So uh, when he talks about mobility, this is what Ari tries to convey. He suggests that in an increasingly borderless world, 
it was necessary to go beyond a mere study of society and to engage with the travels of people, ideas, images, objects, messages, even waste products. There is even a, a, a section of mobilities that deals with sustainable mobilities and money across international borders. And he tries to point out how the implications of such mobility came to be experienced by factors such as time, space, dwelling, and citizenship. So what Ari tries to say is that space is not something that is or something that is contained. It is always an intersection with time. And at the same time, important and that is what conveys meaning to that idea of mobility so space or uh, now if i say that i am at home it doesn't mean that i am a mobile or uh, immobile or static at home internally at least there are a number of things uh, emotions taking place so uh, there is a quotation that i have uh, mentioned in the coming uh, slides and i think that would make the idea clear even dwelling for that matter is not static that is what ari tries to convey. Uh, the idea of citizenship is another entirely another different field of study that Ari brings in and it is a, a bit controversial as well, especially in this time when the idea of citizenship has come under scanner because uh, we have the issue now taking place in Afghanistan and the refugees pouring in from different quarters and then again the question of citizenship becomes important because uh, I'm dealing with that in the coming slides because when people are mobile especially when, when they move under pressure, under force, they are looked at with suspicion. We cannot deny that the migrants, the nomads, or for that matter, we call, uh, in Malayalam, we call the Nadodis. How many of us have entertained Nadodis in our house? We don't do that, right? Because we have this fear of the other, the fear of the mobile, at least people who are mobile, or mobile on account, it's not just a voluntary mobility that I'm talking about here. It's, uh, it, uh, sorry, an involuntary mobility. Uh, it is a mobility that is forced for such people, for refugees and migrants. They have no other option except to move. And that is the reason why they move. And such people are always looked at with suspicion. So I'm moving into those details in the slides to follow. Can I have the next slide where the major theorists of uh, mobility the theory of mobilities are here. John Ari, Mimi Scheller, Peter Adde, Tim Edenser, David Bisson, Tim Cresswell, James Clifford, Mark Orge, Manuel Castells, and Karen Kaplan are just a few handful of theorists that we have. Next slide, please. So these are some works. Of course, there are a number of works. You can come across them. It's all available out there in the net. Bowman's Liquid Modernity is one of the works that initiated the idea of uh, mobilities. Then, of course, the seminal work by Ari, Sociology Beyond Societies, Mobilities for the 21st Century, which came out in 2000. Then we have a number of other works, Mimi Scheller and John Ari's The New Mobilities Paradigm, Tim Cresswell's On the Move, and a number of other works are also there. So these are some of the works that I came across, and I found them interesting as well. So uh, mobilities have been classified by John Ari into five types mainly. The mobility of objects, corporeal mobility, virtual mobility, and communicative mobility. So mobility of objects is, as the term suggests, the movement of objects from one place. to It can be the movement of currency, the movement of even waste, or uh, just simple objects. But the meanings that it carry along with it, this sort of mobility, everything in fact has an ideology behind it. So that also comes under scanner in the mobilities in study of mobilities. Corporeal mobility involves the movement of people for the sake of work, leisure, family life, pleasure, migration, or even to escape. And imaginative mobility is the images of people and places moving across print, visual, and social media. So as example for this, Tim Creswell talks about uh, the idea of people watching television. So television, uh, usually where do we place the television? It's always in the living room and it's always placed somewhere 
where everyone else in the room can, their, their eyes will be naturally fixed on the screen. So we can sit back, relax and watch. And as soon as the TV is on, our eyes naturally move to the TV. And there are, if there are eight members or five members or four members in the family, everyone's eyes are immediately fixed on the TV. And uh, what he means by imaginative mobility is what the emotions or the way we take in the images, the pictures or the ideas that are carried over to us at that moment, at that space when information is disseminated via the television. So this is just one example that Ali says. And he also says that if the placement of the television is also important. Where do we place or how else do we place the furniture if, if we go to any living room for that matter, or a majority of living rooms have the television at the center. It is at a place where you can, all of you can sit and watch at leisure. And your eyes, if there are five members in the family, everyone's eyes should be fixed on the television. And therefore the aesthetic placement of the television matters, the furniture around it matters, and the, the effective mode by which it conveys emotions and information also matters. So this is what uh, Cresswell uh, talks about uh, imaginative mobility in general. Then we have virtual mobility, which is uh, of course mobility via digital media and communication connectivity, which we are all, at least teachers and students, experience on a day-to-day -day basis, because that is the sort of mobility that is always happening with us. And communicative mobility, which is person-to-person -person communication via text, letters, telegraphs, telephone, fax, mobile, smartphones, etc. So the next slide, please. This is another categorization of mobilities that was brought into effect by two other theorists named Leopoldina Fortunatai and Shakari Taipele, who kept the individual and the human body as points of reference. And they categorized mobilities into four macro mobilities micro mobilities, media mobility, and disembodied mobility. So macro mobilities was, uh, according to them, a consistent physical displacement or movement of people from one place to the other, people and uh, embodied movement in general. Micro mobilities refer to small scale displacements, move, movement for uh, sake of leisure or whatever, a small scale movements not large scale tra uh, traveling, but rather uh, small scale movements, movement uh, from one place to the other, just uh, the ones that affected our day-to-day -day lives. Media mobility was related to the media and disembodied mobility was mobility that caused any sort of transformation in the social order. So remember when we talk about mobilities, we are also talking about mobility in terms of movement from one social class to the other, or movement from one, uh, suppose you're moving high up in the ladder of education, even that comes under mobility. So all this is also considered as part of the mobilities theory. And disembodied mobility refers to transformation that happens in the social order. So these are the categori categorizations that were brought forth by Ari, as well as Fortunata and Taipale. So why is the mobility term important? That is what I would like to deal with next. So it was in 2006 that John Ari had pointed out how new forms of virtual and imaginative travel will combine in unexpected ways with physical travel. So he had in fact uh, given the right prediction because now uh, we are at a stage when physical travel has to combine with virtual and imaginative travel. In fact, the tourism sector, at least in some parts of the world, they, uh, they are trying to bring in virtual, the idea of virtual travel uh, for that matter, it, even in the literal sense, in fact. And uh, Scheller and Ari had claimed that issues of movement, of too little movement or too much or of the wrong sort at the wrong time are central to many lives and organizations. So remember all this was said way back in 2006, which has become almost true at this particular juncture when movement it has become an issue when we think whether we should move little or we should move a little if you move a little too much it might cause uh, some sort of a turbulence in, uh, in some other way 
So movement uh, is, is now under scrutiny more than with any, any other time we have experienced before. And uh, it, it is important that we move at the right, in the right way at the right time, especially now that movement has come so much under scrutiny. And mobility scholarship puts movement at center stage for inquiries into its modalities. It seeks to explore the power and politics of discourses and practices of mobility in creating both movement and stasis. So we're talking about the politics of mobility. Again, Tim Chris Cresswell in his work on the move, he talks about uh, a certain ideology at work when talking about the mobilities inside the body. So he gives an example where uh, in, especially when dealing with human fertilization, there is this description of the sperm and the egg. And he quotes uh, from another theorist, Emily, who states that um, the sperm's movement is always described in very energetic terms or virile terms where we have description, even I think that there are uh, animated um, versions of the sperms, of the energetic movement of the sperm. The sperm keeps moving in a very vigorous fashion and the way it very energetically enters the egg. But at the same time, the egg is conceived of in terms of immobility or passivity or in feminine terms. So there is also a metaphor that he, a comparison that he brings about. The egg is much like the princess in grim fairy tales, passive, always waiting for things to happen. Whereas the sperm is always on the moon, energetic and waiting to enter. So the sperm is conceived of in masculine terms and masculinity being equated with mobility and femininity uh, or the, the egg representing femininity is equated with passivity. So all these are certain ideological representations as it, uh, when it uh, comes to the, the way mobilities have been represented even in medical textbooks. So uh, now, uh, lately, of course, uh, uh, Cresswell points out that the active involvement of both the sperm and the egg have been uh, brought to the forefront at present. But then this was at least the way it was talked about. So there is an apparent ideology in the way mobilities are conceived at different spheres, in the different fields, of course. In mobility scholarship, movement is a central object of inquiry rather than an outcome of a set of social, political, and economic processes. So today, we know that uh, since mobilities are under attack more than any time before, interactions, new ways of interactions have emerged and uh, it, is, uh, it has become so ironical that we could say that we are present while apparently absent. Even when we are here on this platform, this virtual platform, we are present here. If you ask us whether we are present, yes, we are present. But then we never know whether you are actually presently present or absent. Uh, so at least that is the case when I take online classes. We have to keep asking for the students. And then we never know whether the students their names are present definitely, but whether the body, whether the corporeal presence is there is a matter of concern. So it is an, uh, a time when everything is under question mark. With the pandemic having imposed its impact on the very notion of movement, it is now important to analyze the extent to which varying phases and modes of mobilities have come to be rendered static some uh, mobilities have slowed down, whereas some have triggered, as I told you earlier, digital mobilities have, def have definitely triggered. So uh, if you look at uh, the data as well, uh, provided by the United Nations World Tourism Barometer, last year, that is in 2020, overnight visitors declined over 70% in the first eight months of 2020 last year. However, in July and August, there was a plunge, probably because people were trying to go home, they were trying to, uh, those who were stuck abroad were trying to come back. So 81% uh, or 79% in increase in arrivals could be seen in July and August. And uh, 
uh, January to August 2020, uh, according to the United Nations, represents 700 million fewer international tourist arrivals compared to the same period in 2019. So uh, there is definitely a drop, a decrease in arrivals. And uh, this is just one sector that I'm talking about. What about the other sectors? Everywhere, definitely this change has been happening. There is a definitive change uh, in, in terms of mobilities. So John Ari uh, suggested the need for this idea of sociology beyond societies because he believed that at that point of time when he was propounding this theory, the idea of mobilities came to be devalued on account of the notion of societies as spatially bounded entities because society was seen just as a structure, a space that was fixed in time. Uh, I, I mean, at least fixed in terms of its uh, uh, a bounded space, which, uh, which did not entail any sort of fluidity. However, in the digital age, Ari felt that it was necessary to think about uh, a, a, a space where societies, or even uh, there are digital societies being formed. We have, uh, for example, when I had dealt with uh, the travel blogs of uh, a few travelers, um, I could uh, find that there were societies that were formed amongst digital travelers, I mean, travelers as such, travel bloggers as such, they have their own societies in the digital space. So it is a very complex idea to think about societies, especially in the digital age. So that is exactly what Ari tried to point out. There is a number of other ways in which we can conceive of societies as well. So Ari quotes Henry Leffer to drive home his point. So this is what I had uh, earlier said uh, about the way Ari tries to conceive of space or uh, whether how fixed can a structure be. So when we think about a house, he says, this is Leffer's quote, a house can be viewed as stable and immovable with stark, cold and rigid outlines. Or we can see any such house is permeated from every direction by, by streams of energy which run in and out of it by every imaginable route. As a consequence, the image of immovability is replaced by an image of a complex of mobilities an excess of in and out conduit. So there are two ways in which you can look at the house. You can conceive of your house as something that is stable and immovable with precise outlines, but you can also conceive of it as something that is dynamic, permeated from every direction by, from, by streams of energy. So there is a lot of movement happening inside, but it is not probably visible to the naked eye. So if you want to look at it in terms of movement, definitely there is movement. Mobility is something that is there in every facet of life. At least that's what Ari tries to point out. So can we move on to the next slide, please? So mobility, the theory of mobility came in as a critique of sedentarism. Sedentarism is uh, an idea, uh, especially Heidegger uh, was the one who first brought in the idea that dwelling or being present somewhere meant to reside, to stay, to be immob uh, immobile, to be content at home or in a place. So sedentarist theorists, the, uh, those who propound the sedentarist metaphysics, they try to treat stability, meaning and place as something that is normal. So uh, those uh, the, the normal way of life, according to sedentarist theorists, is to be stable, is to be rooted at a place. And they treat distance, change, and placenessness as abnormal. So it was as a critique of this idea of sedentariness that uh, we have the uh, mobility theorist bringing in the notion of mobility as something that should be treat, should be foregrounded. So uh, they try to bring in the significance of certain time, especially uh, the dead time that was uh, the to and fro work from journey. I had mentioned that earlier, when you commute, when you go from your house to the workplace, and when you come back from the workplace, those, uh, that period in which you commute is often treated as dead time. But why? 
because that is also a time when a lot of things happen. So it, it, the supposedly dead time of the two world journey and the sedentarist metaphysics across social, cultural, and political thought is what the mobility theorists sought to revalue and critique. So sedentarism talks about bounded or authentic places, regions, or nations as the fundamental basis of human identity and experience. As against this, mobility theorists talk about human migration, individual mobility, travel, transport, and the movement of people even through social classes or income. So the next slide, please. I would like to talk about why the mobility term is important. Yes, am I audible? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma ma okay. So the significance of the mobility term lies in the fact that systematic movement of people for different purposes uh, came to the forefront and the forces that propelled, limited or were produced by these movements became worthy of analysis in the study of mobilities. So Tim Chris Cresswell delves into the theorization of modes by which such mobilities lie at the center of constellations of power, the creation of identities, and the micro geographies of everyday life. So even the local aspects, the, the regional aspects of life, the small movements that take place, to and fro movements, all these and the ideologies that characterize them, all these came to be foregrounded by the mobility theorists, by those scholars who dealt with the idea of mobilities. And then uh, they sought a revaluation of the notion of mobilities as well. Um, with, especially with the onset of COVID-19, they felt that it was important to revalue the notion of mobilities because now uh, is a time when national borders have started closing down. We have lockdowns and quarantine policies being imposed at local scales. It is now even more relevant to think about the way mobilities can be conceived of in this changing scenario. So why is a revaluation necessary is the question. So Tim Cresswell argues that Mobility has come to be devalued as pathological or disease inducing in the current times. So can I have the next slide? The next? Yes. So um, pathological in the sense that I think uh, we would all be familiar with what had happened uh, back in March 2020, that was a time when we came to experience the pandemic at its worst. And uh, the first instance that we had was of a medical student who had come from Wuhan University. She was treated as patient zero. So this labeling also, in as much as it seems important to label, um, this labeling leads to, uh, brings in undertones of discrimination, and uh, it, it gives us a tendency to categorize and label, especially people who are, uh, who are deceased. And, the, and a very good example of this is what happened when the second uh, phase of uh, the virus swept into Kerala. We had a family coming in from Patnam Ditta, And we know the way they were categorized and labeled. I still remember how we used to talk about, uh, at least um, most of us, a majority used to think of those who come from Patanandita as carriers of the disease. So that sort of labeling or uh, categorization is what Creswell feels that uh, became uh, necessary to critique at the time of the pandemic because after COVID-19 at least, uh, mobility came to be devalued as something that was pathological or disease inducing. And mobility was seen as a problem and there were, there were impositions of bans on travel, which led to the rise of various forms of localisms. The situation arises on account of the fact that to be viral, so the contradiction here is a virus by itself cannot move. However, a virus needs a body to move, definitely. It cannot move by itself. But when you say something is viral, the meaning is to move even if, you, if it is a video that has become viral, whatever that has become viral, the idea that, that is implied in it is movement. 
So even though a virus by itself cannot move, to be viral means to move in spite of the fact that viruses cannot move. So prior to the situation also, Creswell says that mobility was seen as a symptom that needed diagnosis and treatment. The negative valuation of mobility arose on account of the fact that rootedness and boundedness came to be valorized prior to this time. And the mobility of the homeless, the nomads, the migrants, and the refugees came to be devalued. Mobile people and things were labeled as disruptive. They were looked down with suspicion, hostility, and fear. So we, uh, we have witnessed, or at least we have seen uh, in the news at that time, um, when there was a large exodus of migrant, of wage laborers and migrant workers from metropolitan cities in India. And uh, there was an incident that happened in Bareilly where uh, the, the, the entire group of migrant workers, they were sprayed with insecticides. And the nodal officer, uh, gave, uh, when he was asked about the situation, the answer that he gave was it was, on a, it was for their safety that this was done in spite of the fact that it was extremely dangerous to spray pesticides on people especially. So they were seen not as people in fact, they were seen just as a mobile body of people who bore viruses. So they were seen in fact more in terms of the label that was attached to mobility or to mobile people as virus bo uh, bodies that bear viruses. So all this uh, keeps happening around us and uh, uh, this is especially a, a change. It was there earlier itself, but then this change is still happening where mobility has come to be associated with something that is that induces disease or something that is to be looked down with suspicion. Cresswell argues that the term pathological has been used as a metaphorical way of understanding mobilities as an accusation towards undesirable populations. Susan Craddock, in her book, A City of Plagues, talks about the way this usage of mobility in a negative sense intensifies the rhetoric of hatred, fear, and blame of the marginalized and creates a rational basis for surveillance, control, and exclusion. Creswell stresses that most of the terms associated with diseases, so if you look at all those terms that we have associated with diseases that spread, contagion, epidemic, pandemic, all these notions bear the idea of mobility within. Even infrastructure that is associated with the idea of traveling, like trains, railway stations, and carriages, especially now we, uh, we caution people against using public transport because such infrastructure has come, uh, public transport has come to be associated with the idea of disease transmission. So in the present situation, even airports and aeroplanes are considered to be nodal points from where COVID-19 spreads. So Cresswell points out how the literal becomes figurative and this leads to an ultimate devaluing of the idea of mobility. There is a, a quotation by Roger Key on the situation. He says, diseased bodies step out of the realm of the normal into a new normal of uncertainty where the world they know is turned upside down. Here lies the historical reality of the continued treatment of the deceased as foreign bodies through an often racialized phantasmagoric representation that treats the sick body of an individual as an intruding threat to the supposedly healthy national body. So the self-same logic is at work when we think about migrants coming in from elsewhere, refugees. This is the reason why all of them are looked down upon with suspicion. Mobile bodies are equated with deceased bodies, leading to racialization and suspicion of the marginalized, the migrants and the laborers. And this entails a categorization and labeling of such bodies that are also couched around the narratives of slackness, irresponsibility, and immorality. So even the incident that happened at Verily uh, was on account of the fact that there was a, a rhetoric of irresponsibility associated with the migrants. So I think even uh, at that point of time, I still remember even in Ernakulam, there was a situation where uh, uh, near the bypass, we had uh, a number of 
migrant workers coming together and said so it was it, it in fact created a reverse effect where on one hand mobilities were stalled where on the other hand there was a burst of mobilities so even now the situation is there because where we have lockdown there are certain days when shops are not supposed to open certain days so we can and i remember in a conversation that i had with one of my uh, one of the shopkeepers near the college he said how on those particular days when they were allowed to open there was a, a general an influx of people there was yeah. so it was in fact a reverse effect where when we try to control on the one hand there is a burst of mobilities on the other hand so a reevaluation of mobilities is necessary today even more than before because activities like daily commuting to the workplace which is considered as dead time came under marginalized mobility travel was envisaged as derived demand because the need to travel was derived from other things that came first what was prioritized was being at home residence or going to work or leisure all this was prioritized and the time that we traveled in between was never taken for consideration the new mobilities paradigm attempts to place mobility center stage and tries to enrich the dead time the supposedly dead time with life and meaning by demonstrating how mobilities are enacted on foot on cycles in trains cars and planes so mobility is seen as entangled in issues of power politics and social justice so with the pandemic placing a grip on every field of human activity many everyday human mobilities have come to a grinding halt and some have been drastically reorganized i think we need to move to the next slide yes in the space of a few days businesses socio cultural activities supply chains production systems etc have come to a standstill and what was earlier considered as normal meeting friends over a cup of tea a stroll in the park a night out a relative meeting relatives meeting colleagues in public places all these have become things of the past and uh, a majority of us now have now shifted to online work many have been thrown out from work many have shifted to rural villages businesses are in a situation of crisis students are forced to study online even the shipment of goods and services have been severely affected so this such is a condition under the pandemic and uh, now is a time when immobility isolation and social and physical distancing have been touted as the only possible solution and the new normal has been accepted as an endorsement of these conditions the new normal also demanded a renegotiation of our earlier mobilities thereby redrafting the conditions that defined desirable or undesirable so now mobilities have been categorized in fact or even more than ever we talk about mobilities that are desirable mobilities that are undesirable it has it has become important and significant to think about mobilities to a large extent earlier we never used to think twice before a hug or a handshake or a snuggling or a reassuring hold it was considered as normal everyday practice but now uh, before taking a picture or before uh, before a hug or an encounter we need to think twice today they are looked upon as forms of mobility that are done away with in fact but at the same time when uh, mobilities everyday mobilities came to a, a standstill or at least they were slowed down uh, there was international and national mobilities were also affected but at the same time simultaneously there was a tremendous acceleration in digital mobilities online platforms became sole points of refuge for millions across the globe for purposes of work study referencing and as well as reunions and even as there is a condition of physical immobility there is at the same time a peak in virtual mobilities online presence has now substituted physical presence a walk to the so just imagine for those who are working from home at least there are small little things that we still miss all the 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 walk that we take to the workplace meeting with colleagues sometimes in between we go on a soothing trip to the canteen uh, the small talks that we have with our friends in between so all these are little things that we miss um, and all that the 
the time that uh, we had spent for all those activities have now been taken over by monotonous hours in front of the screen. In short, the digital has conquered almost every realm of sensory experience that kept the element of humanness alive. So this idle time between work, or what we had earlier classified as idle time, if we look back now, was it actually idle time? It was actually me time, rather. At least for those of us who do not have me time, that was the time when uh, we cherished the, the, the small talks, the conversations. All this has become compressed and work has uh, become monotonized and it has been replaced. Uh, earlier we had for work, uh, at least represented a building, an edifice, colleagues, tea breaks, exchange of ideas and a backdrop against which we work. Everything is lost and uh, everything has been compressed into endless hours that we sit in front of the screen and there is even no boundary between work time and personal time. And the most overwhelming transformation that occurred was in the field of education. It became entirely dependent on online learning and digital mobilities have now become the new normal. And as work shifted from sophisticated edifices to the comfort of homes, there has been a considerable shift in time spaces that were ordinarily encountered. We have spillovers of work time into family time, which has consequently emptied uh, the burden of uh, double or triple labor on women. And uh, there is uh, a blurring of boundaries between the familial and the professional world. Women have especially entered a phase of struggle as they strive to organize work, child care, elder care, domestic duties, and so on. And when travel has reduced, at the same time, there is also a reduce in fears of sexual harassment. But at the same time, it has intensified fears of domestic violence, stress, anxiety, and further chances of abusive control over women. So it also has a gendered aspect to it. So uh, we have to come to the conclusion that there are differential mobility empowerments. When we talk about mobilities, there are structures and hierarchies of power that also need to be talked about. And another important issue that the pandemic raises for is the question of surveillance as movement becomes heavily controlled with bio-governance and biopolitics coming to the forefront. Every it, it, it has come to a point where everyone's movement needs to be traced. At least uh, at the time when the pandemic set in, uh, we, uh, this tracking of movement was very much, or at least was considered very significant. We have now measures like biometric surveillance, self-testing, contact tracing technologies, and even the idea of a global database is probably in the office. So uh, this is a time when surveillance technologies have considered to be the new normal uh, also incorporates ideas of surveillance technologies. Rob Kitchen suggests five primary responses in surveillance technologies that aim at the management of mobile population. Quarantine enforcement or travel permission, contact tracing, pattern and flow modeling, social distancing and movement monitoring, symptom tracking, and so on. And the body has become vulnerable more than ever. So much so that the new normal also implies new norms for the mobile body. Eileen Schatcher, uh, another theorist, talks about the politics of borders in these times and feels uh, that the most recent development of recent years is that borders are neither open nor closed it's in between. Borders keep expanding and shrinking selectively and strategically according to the target population, thus emphasizing the presence of a politics, a definite politics of exclusion. And for mobile people especially, the border remains a permanent and static barrier at the frontier of territory. It might not be a visible border, but there is a politics at work so uh, Eilish Schatcher talks about the politics at work that keeps borders simultaneously open and closed, thus enabling a regulation of mobility from a distance, at the same time stepping up surveillance powers at home. And this trend has accelerated in the wake of the pandemic. There, there is a close monitoring and policing of immigrant entry, which has ensured that undesirable mobilities are curbed 
while maintaining a semblance of human rights concern in the selective openness of borders. So in short, borders haven't disappeared, but they keep transforming as complex concerns keep depriving the deprived and the onus falls on the tripartite dimensions of territory, culture and wealth. So it is on the basis of these three aspects that nations decide whether entry should be permitted or not. If you're wealthy, if you can in, in assimilate into the culture, if you have territorial linkages, fine. Then you, you can be permitted an entry. So there is a politics definitely at work when it comes to the idea of borders. And when you talk about borders, it is not just national borders that we need to think about now. The pandemic has also instilled the need for drawing personal borders, borders even within our private confines. As social distancing has become the buzzword, even our doorsteps have become borders. And it has also been extended to workplaces, cities, regions, states, and nations. The, the idea of COVID-19 itself has become a temporal border because now I think more than BC and AD, again, we would think about pre-COVID and post-COVID times, separation of the new normal from the past. And when, when we talk about the hashtag stay at home, that in itself entails difference because we come to talk about it casually, stay home, stay safe. It's something that we keep telling everyone. We, we keep telling our relatives this, but then we forget the fact that there is a difference that is entailed in this idea. There is an exclusion, a deliberate exclusion of the homeless and the ones in constant, maybe not deliberate, but at the same time, there is this exclusion. What do we say to the homeless? What do we say to the ones in constant mobility? How can we tell them stay home, stay safe? Is that possible? So it is in this context that Bowman's differential mobility becomes relevant. While the rich stay at home, the disposable workforce are required to leave the comfort of their homes, thereby reinforcing the borders between them and us, the rich and the poor, the healthy and the sick. And uh, as even as if we should remember that our most essential services are carried out by migrant workers, but they are the ones who are left with no health care or protective gear. Millions of wage laborers are either stranded or left to find their way back home. And uh, after the crisis, after the pandemic, most of them were deprived of jobs and livelihood. And even as the virus permeates boundaries and steps across all these borders, it has also created borders, we should say, from the strictly regulated national borders to the borders we have drawn across a threshold to the borders between the deceased and the non-deceased, the rich and the poor, the natives and the migrants, the digital and non-digital citizens, I think borders have come to be enhanced all the more. And what then will we consider as the new normal? <clears throat> as our needs have now been reshuffled on the basis of a new order. Question that poses is, will there be a return to what is generally called the normal? Sisak states that there is no return to normal. The new normal will have to be constructed on the ruins of our old lives, or we will find ourselves in a new barbarism whose signs are already clearly discerned. As work and education have been forced into technologization, the new normal calls for a digital way of life, which as Leotard has predicted, he says, knowledge is and will be produced in order to be sold. It is and will be consumed in order to be valued in a new production. In both gate cases, the goal is exchange. Knowledge ceases to be an end in itself. It loses its use value. Whether it is a new normal or a repetition of the old, that is a question that we need to ponder over. I think we need to go to the next slide. Yeah, so the pandemic seems to have accelerated the old rather than ushering the new, we should say, because none of us were actually prepared for what we now call the new normal. We should say that uh, we, even when we were unprepared, we were in fact uh, trying to step up what we already had. We, with the little technology that we had, 
uh, most of us didn't, uh, we were not familiar with the digital platform when it came to education, especially uh, online education was new to many of us. But then we equipped ourselves in fast in ways that the, uh, we, 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 it, the, the times demanded that we accelerate uh, or we step up our technology uh, and for the purpose. And that is exactly what we done. We are totally unprepared, but we did that. So the old has rather been accelerated. Uh, therefore, perhaps it's not the new normal, it's just an acceleration of what was there. And in the face of this change, it is necessary to stay cautioned against arguments in favor of imposing forms of control. As Sisek puts it, in including the geolocation of infected people and the suspension in a case state of exception of civil liberties is something that we need to be wary of. Theorists like Ele and Adorno also repeat the same and they stress that the technology of control would destroy democracy and lead to totalitarianism and barbarism. It would end tolerance, difference and diversity. So remembrance and memory are needed so that historical fascisms are not repeated, albeit in new guises. So the new normal would entail a responsibility of placing ethics and humanity about other considerations and an immersion in historical rather than screen time in order to take part in complicated yet meaningful conversations. So this is a quote from Otisha Adams, a character that I have come across. Normal is an illusion. What is normal for the spider is chaos for the fly. So what is the normal? The new normal is perhaps being ethical. That perhaps is what we should think about when we come to talk about the new normal. So that is about it. And uh, that's, I think the next slide has to be taken. Uh, I have given one or two quotations. So what do you mean by the new normal? Maybe uh, the new normal is something that we are facing right now. We never know what it is. But then one thing that we need to prioritize when we are in this present condition is ethics. We definitely need to prioritize that. We need to understand that ethics more than anything else and meaningful engagement in conversations, meaningful interactions will be more important than ever before in order to sustain uh, the new normal in, uh, in ways that would be beneficial for us. So with that, I would like to wind up my lecture and I hope uh, you, uh, you were able to glean, glean something out of it. Thank you very much. It was a great session with you, ma'am. Thank you so much Thank to share you. your thoughts with us. So now this is the time for the question answer session. So if anyone need further clarification or anyone have any doubt about today's session, can unmute your mic and ask directly to the speaker or else you can type it in the chat box. Thank you, everyone. So, is there any clarifications? Ma'am, it's not just a clarification, it's actually just the ball rolling for our conversation, for our discussion. Exactly. Because obviously, I know that uh, you are intending for a very interactive session, and I'm sure many of us have yes. a lot of new ideas. Like we say, exactly. Malayalam, exactly. Malayalam exactly. Like our... please, please continue. Please, sorry. No, I, I, I was just saying that most of us have been dumbstruck by what we have accepted as the norm is actually something, you know, which is not, uh, what do you say, uh, is not at all normal, in fact. But it has been seen as the normal term that you use. Them. So it's just a comment. I mean, uh, just the thought came to my mind while I was listening to your talk is the, the, you said the word viral. Sorry, how I didn't hear you. Viral. Viral, yes, yes, yes. Uh, so actually, I was thinking how the word viral in another, uh, what do you say, form of it is trending, you know, the word yes. trending also. It's yes, during the yes. pandemic that I feel that this word gained current, gained, you know, 
uh, a sort of push into it, trending and viral, because a lot of TikToks or uh, videos or even Yes, exactly. So uh, it was when I came came across this idea of uh, the virus, and uh, it was then that I came to understand that there is a definitive link between the notion of mobility and the idea of viral, because uh, and that was a contradiction also because as I mentioned, a virus is actually something uh, a being that cannot move. It, needs another body to move but the fact that viral the idea of the viral came to be associated with movement became uh, became something of a question mark to me i was wondering how uh, because when we say viral is as as you mentioned a word that is trending in modern times and uh, uh, perhaps it is actually worth thinking about the way virus and viral and how how even though the fact that a virus is something that does not have movement how come it came to be associated with an idea that suggests so much of movement that is something that is definitely interesting and worth consideration and uh, perhaps mobility theorists would uh, would like to uh, move into uh, this area of movement where um, where the viral that uh, the question is whether it is used in a positive or a negative sense so when it comes to digital mobilities i feel the idea of viral is positive or at least uh, it means that something someone has taken notice of something so i think there is a difference between privileged mobilities and unprivileged mobilities as well which is something that mobility theorists also talk about because uh, when you uh, talk about travel literature in general traveling and backpacking and uh, movie movement for the sake of leisure that is definitely movement that is privileged but there is also the idea of mobility that is unprivileged so there is a clear demarcation between these two ideas and i think it is it will be interesting to think about the term viral also in that sense so uh, when when you say something is viral definitely you mean that it, in a positive sense that it has spread or that that it has uh, it has been seen and acknowledged there is of, of course a small dimension of negativity in it but at the same time it means that it has been acknowledged but this uh, simultaneously there is also this idea of the virus that is in movement and there we we mean it in uh, there is a slight uh, negative connotation to it as well so i think the question of privilege is something that uh, mobility theorists place a lot of importance on whether the movement uh, when, when you consider movement whether it is privileged movement or unprivileged movement and it is unprivileged movement or mobilities that are not desire considered desirable that they focus on uh, and uh, that that they try to bring to the forefront because it's also a matter of ethics when you come to think about it but yes uh, i think it will be interesting to go into the history of this uh, perhaps the etymology and uh, the way it has come to be associated with this idea as well exactly yes that's what i was also thinking <laughs> Thank yeah. you, ma'am. So I am opening the forum to anyone who would like to ask a question. Please remember that you can unmute your mic and ask. And if you are uh, hesitant or if you have net connectivity issues, please use the chat box and type in the question. I think there's a question in the chat box about the future of travel literature or travel narratives in pandemic time. So uh, I think that's a very important question because the first thing that I actually wanted to deal with was travel literature during the time of the pandemic. And uh, unfortunately, I couldn't come across uh, many interesting materials, uh, and that pointed to the fact that uh, travel literature, in fact, had been affected by the pandemic. And there, I also came across an article in between that talked about uh, the history of traveling in uh, uh, travel literature in general, especially with relation to India, and. Uh, it uh, talked of it. There, there was certainly hope because now, of course, I think there are travel groups and there are people who have started traveling right away. Um, uh, even just yesterday, one of my uh, teachers, one, one of my professors, had uh, informed that she was uh, she was actually uh, among with a travel group. 
So uh, I do feel that there is a future for travel literature, especially because people would definitely, uh, movement is something, mo uh, movement and mobility is something that we cannot do away with in spite of anything that we might say to the contrary, in spite of the pandemic. So even mobility theorists talk about the SARS, uh, we had the first part of this virus in fact, the SARS corona, uh, the, the first part uh, of SARS virus had of course been there. And uh, in spite of that mobility still, there, there was this idea of movement. Movement could not come to a standstill because that is inborn. I think uh, every human being has the persistent, he feels the persistent need, he or she feels the persistent need to travel. And therefore, I do feel that travel literature is something that is born out of a passion. It's not something that you do just for the sake of doing it. There is a lot of passion involved in it. There is a lot of emotion involved in it. Uh, and uh, those who are passionate about something will definitely keep doing it. So I don't think even though perhaps it has been, it has suffered a decline recently, it will uh, come back uh, to uh, perhaps to its former glory. And travel writers, I feel, will continue uh, to write because it is, uh, as um, mobility theorists rightly states, movement is uh, associated not just with mobility, in fact, is associated with not just sheer movement. There is a lot of internal movement also going on, your emotions, your association with the place, the way you're closely bound to the place that you're part of, all this is also relevant. And uh, that will continue. I do not think it's going to suffer a decline. It, maybe uh, there is um, a slight um, uh, decline, but that that will not go to the future, hopefully. Uh, yes, can I? Uh, I? Another person has raised a hand. Yes, ma'am. Uh, there's a Merle Sebastian here. She's a yes. student of our semester two UG student. So yes, Merle, I would like over to, talk. to you. Ma'am, uh, you used the term micro geographies of everyday life while talking about significance of mobility term. Could you please yes. differentiate the present example? Micro geographies refer to the small scale movements uh, that we have. Uh, like, uh, as I earlier mentioned, uh, perhaps down the alley, if you have a conversation with your friend, the small, the small talks, uh, those aspects of life that we miss right now, especially I have talked talk to you about the idle time that we usually call the idle time between work, the small, like, for example, when I was doing my FTP at the uh, Institute of, I was on FTP at the Institute of English, and that time, the, the, the precious time that we had at that time was the movement to the canteen for a cup of tea. Also, so the, all those small scale movements come under a micro geography. The, the little, little, um, the, 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 the moments that we perhaps cherish even now more than before, those small scale displacements are as relevant today as any as ever before. Maybe we had never cherished that before, but now it becomes, when we think about it, see nostalgia certainly counts a lot. So when we think about it, 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 it attains a lot of relevance in contemporary times. I hope I'm here. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, now we have Samuel Sebastian also who's raised his hand. Okay. Samuel is also a student of our college. Uh, he's okay, uh, so. doing his uh, BA with us. So Samuel, over to you. Uh, hello, ma'am. Hello, Samuel. Uh, I was, uh, my question is, what type of mobility do you think would gain currency in the future? Or uh, would another type be formed in itself? I'm not sure, but uh, at the rate at which we are moving forward, definitely digital mobilities will be, uh, will take, uh, will be foregrounded in the future, at least that is something that I presume, I do not know. Uh, but then uh, gathering from what, uh, the way we are moving towards now, so that is the reason why I, when I uh, concluded, I also stressed on the necessity of humanness, of uh, our involvement. So um, I, there was a part where I had mentioned that there, it, it is important to 
give uh, more importance or, or at least we should consciously think about historical time rather than screen time otherwise in the near future when especially because let, let alone college students we have uh, from the kg sessions students are now in front of the screen they see nothing but the screen their studies are solely in front of the screen and they see their classmates only in terms of that even my kids are uh, uh, under the same situation so uh, how what is our future uh, in such uh, when the condition is as such perhaps we need to think more about investing or consciously investing time uh, in the real lived time okay rather than screen time because that is also equally important because i do feel that the way forward is for digital mobilities if you have your perspectives to share definitely you can and uh, th thank you ma'am thank you thank you and i believe what you said is right ma'am i think we are also moving on to the digital mobility exactly era as well so yeah. uh, i think we have an another question also from uh, yadu. yadu krishnan p yes. yadu is also a final year student in our college yadu okay. over to you yadu can you hear me yes 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 ma'am ah oh, yes 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 what's your question yadu can you hear me i believe uh, he has some net issue okay fine yadu if you uh, don't mind can you type the question uh, philip sir over to you yeah ma'am can i ask you a question um <laughs> yeah uh, it's been says that we are always returning you know, uh, yes. you know e even though uh, we move or we leave everything we are returning uh, returning in a sense of uh, emotions you know mm -hmm. so you have you you talked about the imaginative um imaginative immobility like okay. something like yes. you know? so uh, uh, are we um, entitling the elder people uh, who are really supposed to move uh, physically uh, from home to the near place as you said the micro geographic movement mm -hmm. even then mm -hmm. so uh, are we um, are we trying to or this immobility uh, in the pandemic situation trying them to return uh, to their uh, emotions uh, their memories or you know their uh, what they had in their um, um, in, in in their life so uh, that's what I, i i would like to ask if for a person who is unable to move uh, in uh, a person who is unable to move um, in their nearby areas are they subjected to return to their um, uh, to their past i think what came to my mind when you asked this question is uh, i do not know it, uh, whether uh, you had seen it because uh, as um, merina ma'am i think it was merina ma'am right who had talked about uh, um viral the term viral yeah. <laughs> so yes ma'am there was a poem by onv that had become viral in re it, it soon after the pandemic i feel where he had been talking about his ancestral poem and how he missed uh, the his being in that place surrounded by nature uh, in the tarawada there and uh, the the chirping of the birds the twittering of the birds and the trees around him the nature the lush green nature around him there was a beautiful poem that was in circulation uh, supposedly written by wendy and uh, i think yes as philip sir rightly mentioned uh, it is a time when perhaps our inner mobilities can be set to motion uh, can, can 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 come to the forefront because we get time more time to spend uh, with our family i think that is one of the perks of uh, the pandemic uh, that we get time to spend with our family members more than ever and most uh, for, for most of us especially who are entitled to have a home and a family uh that was a time when uh, our mobilities were um, 
I mean, at least internally, we could become more mobile than ever. And if at least we, uh, we thought about setting aside our phones for some time, smartphones for some time, then this would be a very good possibility. We take some time to spend with our elderly and perhaps then uh, we could go back to the past along with them. And that is one refreshing change that the pandemic could bring forth, especially now, uh, unfortunately, my grandparents are no longer there, but then when they were there, uh, I remember that each time when I used to visit them, this was uh, one refreshing change to listen to the stories of the past because for them, memories of the past are alive more than ever. And uh, they are, I think, uh, their mobilities are more in terms of the past. And uh, for us, it would be a refreshing change as well, especially for the uh, student, uh, the children of the modern generation who, ne who have never gotten to experience such things. It would be a, a, a great shift in terms of imaginative <laughs> mobilities. But then uh, I would like to clarify something, please, sir. In, uh, what imaginative mobilities, or at least uh, what uh, I think that was brought forward by uh, two, two other theorists. Uh, so um, what they intended was, Ari and the other sociologists who have talked about imaginative mobilities, what, at least what they intended was the way, uh, now for example, when we sit in front of the television screen, the way the images that were, that the moving images on the television imaginatively, um, or we could imaginatively assimilate those images or the way we accepted them into our mind. That is precisely what they meant by imaginative mobilities. That's the context in which they had placed it. I think there's another question in the chat. Uh, Philip, sir, I hope I have uh, answered yeah, it. Yeah, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Yedu has given a question here in the chat box. He said, society simultaneously connect as well as withdraw. Could you give a pleasant scenario while it's still uh, relevant? It's not just society. It's uh, about individuals that uh, Simel had talked about. It's, uh, he, he gave the metaphor of the bridge and the door. So it is, I think, a general tendency in each and every one of us. It's not just about society as a whole. Uh, Every one of us has a tendency to simultaneously connect as well as withdraw. Uh, because uh, even me for that matter, uh, there are moments when I wish to be by myself, when I feel easy. Uh, perhaps uh, one of the complex things about the online education, like if we take a survey about how students would like uh, the way forward or how they would like their education in the future, at least a small percentage of them would still say that uh, they, they would still prefer online education. Why? Because uh, it helps them to simultaneously withdraw and interact at the same time. That is one of the good things about having an online session, at least for students. Teachers have no other go, but for students, you know, if they want to be very much present there, they can be. If, if you say they are present, yes, they are present. If not, they are absent. So there, it's a sort of an absent presence or a present absence. So uh, every one of us has that tendency to interact as well as withdraw, and uh, we can make that choice. Uh, and uh, that is what Simmel tries to point out through the metaphor of the bridge and the door. If we want, if, if we have that innate tendency within us to go out there to connect, to interact, to forge uh, connections. And if we need to make that choice, of course, we can cross over, cross the bridge, open the door and do it. If not, we can also take the choice to withdraw. So the bridge, the metaphor of the bridge is uh, that, that will to connect, but at the same time, there is also a tendency to withdraw. I hope that is clear, Yadu. Okay, thank you, Yadu. Uh, is if the any other participant would like to ask ask any questions or would like to put out their thought or view on the topic, kindly do so now. The forum is open for a discussion to all the participants. Thank you. So thank you for all the questions and thank you so much, ma'am, for clarifying our doubts. Excuse I think there's another question in the chat box. Thank you.
can I address the question? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Please. Ma okay. Do you think this imaginative mobility will have its impact on the narrative structure of travel literature? Yes, definitely it can have its impact because uh, this uh, idea of imaginative mobility was actually uh, the, the example that was given was on the basis of whatever you see in front of your TV screen or the way uh, you imaginatively connect to the images that virtually move across you. So it uh, it will have its impact in the way that uh, suppose like uh, there is some, uh, if, if this is a time when virtual travel has also become relevant. So, uh, and we all, it's also a time of vlogs and uh, travel blogs and vice versa. So we have a number of other things. Uh, and uh, suppose your, uh, your travel, whatever you write. So we have different types of travel writers and the tra there are travel writers who go out there and experience, physically experience the landscape and uh, the images and nature that they, they come, come into contact with. And on the basis of that, uh, they give their honest, authentic impressions. There are also others who, who undertake perhaps virtual travel or on the basis of hearsay, what they write or on the basis of what they watch uh, on television. Or perhaps that we also have the example of William Dalrymple, I think he had, I had come across a BBC documentary, I think that he had done, um, a, a walking tour in fact. And uh, he was in fact going to different places um, along with uh, the host and uh, he was giving his own description on the basis of what he was seeing right in front of him. And uh, he had also uh, uh, written a book on the basis of the same. So that uh, can be perhaps, uh, we could cite that as an instance of uh, imaginative mobility because uh, perhaps he had been influenced by what he himself has done on screen when he had uh, written the book later on. So uh, in that sense, yes, it can have its impact on travel literature as well. I hope I've answered your question, Manjula. Yes, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. You have done justice. Can you introduce question. yourself? Sorry, uh, uh, can you introduce I'm yourself? I'm Manjula from SDV College, Alapi. Oh, OK, OK, OK. Thank yes. you so much. I have, I, have I have been there in St. Joseph's. I have been there in St. Joseph's. Okay, okay, okay. I got you. <laughs> yes, I'm so yes. sorry. I'm so sorry. Yes, it's okay. It's okay. It was an interesting session. You, you gave a new turn to that mobility turn and everybody got really enlightened and very well informed. Thank you. About Thank that you. Topic. It was really good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Saran. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Manjula, ma'am, for your question. Uh, yes. Is there anyone else who would like to present your view or add to the discussion? Hi, ma'am. Hi, Anuja. Hi, ma'am. It was a really wonderful session. You had uh, you. almost included all the theories. Actually, you included Marxism even in it yes, through the yes, yes. disparity in social status. Yes. yes, yes. Uh, so uh, adding to what you have you said today, yes. uh, I, I got reminded of something, a poem that was uh, mm -hmm. written in Madhrubhumi Archipadipa. I came across okay. this when uh, the lockdown started last year. So okay. I'm sorry, I, do, I don't remember who wrote it, but mm -hmm. the content was in such a way that uh, you everybody knows about the story of Kalidasa in which uh, mm -hmm. Durga is knocking at the door and asking mm -hmm. who is it inside uh, mm -hmm. and uh, he says yes it is Kalidasa Ka Dasa mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the person outside is saying uh, Kali Anapurath so okay. in this particular poem uh, the poet was saying in the contemporary uh, situation you can relate mm -hmm. it to uh, the way in which the corona is outside and okay. we are immobile and sitting inside. Okay. Yes, uh, so uh, suddenly I was uh, reminded of this particular poem when uh, you said about this mobility and immobility in the social spheres. And yes, yeah. it was a really wonderful session. Thank and you, uh, I'm very happy to hear you. Uh, thank, thank you, you ma'am. Thank you, Anuja. I would also, uh, I mean, if there are any more questions, certainly I can wait. Uh, I, I...
any more questions or any any view points also would be welcome ma'am i believe uh, it yeah i believe we not got any more i guess okay okay so can we i hope we can proceed further yes yes the yes, certain okay. certain okay thank you ma'am uh, josna over to you yeah thank you for all the questions and thank you so much ma'am for clarifying our doubts thank you josna so moving on to the next on behalf of the pg department of english we have a token of appreciation and love for you ma'am and for your time please thank accept you. a small token of love from our side thank you thank you so much that's beautiful <laughs> thank you very much it's lovely <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. And last, I would like to welcome Malavika A from S Y B A for a word of thanks. Good morning, everyone. To speak gratitude is courteous and pleasant. To enact gratitude is generous and noble. But to leave gratitude is to touch heaven. I would like to thank our chief guest. Dr. Sharon Dikuna, who honored this session with her inspirational thoughts. Thank you for being a valuable member of our team. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Dear Principal, Father Vijay George Pondebali, we are continually impressed with your ability to unite our campus community. With your long hours and hard work, make such a difference to ensure the learning. and growth of both our students and staff i did also thank our beloved hod shema ma'am for her guidance and moral support i'm happy to express a word of thanks for Thank our teach that has made this e colloquium a grand success through their motivation and dedication i would like to thank every coordinators for all your support and encouragement happy for working with you and also thank you audience for your patience and attention in this morning session i can see that our time is just about up so to finish i would like to thank everyone once again for being a part of this section thank you and have a nice day thank you so much malavika a good event never ends in the world they take only a pause and keep us awaiting for the next so once again i thank everyone for your valuable time cooperation support and for accepting our invitation and became a part of today's event so thank you and have a nice day thank you josna and i would also like to place on record uh, my gratitude to uh, all the faculty members and the student community of the uh, naipunya school of management principal faculty members the hod shema ma'am uh, anuja uh, thank you uh, for inviting me and uh, philip sir um, especially merina ma'am sorry um, uh, the coordinator uh, every one of you uh, for thinking of me and uh, for inviting me over it was a wonderful enriching experience to be here and uh, to interact with the academic and the student community thank you very much and i look forward to more such sessions at least uh, if, if not as uh, a speaker at least as a participant uh, so do let me know of future sessions too thank you thank you so much ma'am uh, before thank you ma'am before we conclude i would like to give a few reminders to all the participants kindly ensure that you enter in the correct details so that your certificate will have the correct details as well please remember that your certificate will be sent to your mail within the week's time thank you so much once again for all of us, all of you guys who joined from all different parts of the country kema ma'am yes over to you i'm sorry for interrupting no no it's okay marina thank you ma'am thank you sharan ma'am for the wonderful section it was a new yes, concept sir. for our students and you opened a new avenue of thought of accepting this new scenario as our new normal it was really an informative session thanks a lot ma'am thank you, ma 
thank you for thanks this. thanks to you as well as i told you it's <laughs> mutual <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah. thank you ma'am thank you thank you all once again thank you so much sharan ma'am for agreeing to be with us this day and spending your precious time with us thank you to all the coordinators to our hod to anuja ma'am and to philip sir once again i hope and i pray and i wish you all to using the finger quotes stay safe <laughs> as nan said in her you know the normal yeah so let's stay safe let's stay happy and let's stay blessed thank you so much and have a great weekend thank, thank you thank you thank you very much sharan ma'am thank you thank you so much for this wonderful session thank, thank you thank you sir